the Child Psych Podcast brings to you the top parenting and mental health experts in the world, designed to educate and inspire you with current research and concrete strategies that foster resiliency and healing in children and teens. Most importantly, we're here because we need to raise a generation of children who don't need to recover from their childhoods. Hello, I am Tanya Johnson. And I'm Tammy. And we are psychologists, co-founders of the Institute of Child Psychology, and probably most importantly, mums. Yeah, and we're so excited to have Lexi Kite back with us. We've actually had her before at our conference. Her and her sister, Dr. Lexi Kite, and her identical twin, Dr. Lindsay Kite, are co-authors of the book, More Than a Body. Your body is an instrument, not an ornament, which we will be coming back to that phrase later on. <laughs> and she is a co-director of the nonprofit Beauty Refined. Uh, Lindsay and Lexi both received PhDs from the University of Utah in the study of female body image, and have become leading experts in body image resilience and media literacy. Authors of numerous studies and books have cited Lindsay and Lexi's original research, and they've been featured on a variety of national media outlets, including the New York Times, CNBC, the Boston Globe, Slate, Shape, Glamour, Teen Vogue, and more. It's quite a mouthful oh, there. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> thank you for making us one of your people. We're very happy. Oh, to. absolutely. <laughs> Lexi, is there anything you want to add to that bio that you feel is important that's not in there? Uh, no. I mean, that was plenty. And you'll learn more about me as we talk. So no, that's great. Thank Beautiful. you. Yeah. Okay. So Lexi, your big thing, and what Tammy and I was so excited to ask you about today is... Um, you and Lindsay talk a lot about body objectification. Can you talk mm. a little bit more about this? Yes. Okay. So Lindsay and I, through all of our research, um, our coursework when we were going through school and the many years since now have really believed that we have found the root to the problem of body image that so many girls and women and increasingly people of all genders experience. Um, what we found is that while lots of people can see that girls and women are suffering with um, feeling badly about their bodies, with feeling self-conscious, fixated on their bodies. Many of them are trying to solve the problem in the same way. And it's a way that we have found is not actually solving the problem at all. It might be slapping a Band-Aid on it, but it is absolutely not getting to the root of the problem. So we believe that so many people come at this problem the wrong way when they say, oh my gosh, people are suffering from, from body image concerns. We need to share a message with them to help them understand how amazing they are. And the message goes something like this. Girls, women, you are so beautiful, exactly as you are. If you had any idea how beautiful you are, flaws at all, you would have the confidence to just go out there and change the world. You just have to realize it first. And for a second, that feels good, you know, for so many of us who from a million different messages throughout our lives have been told we're not good enough, hearing that we're beautiful or that maybe we're more beautiful than we think we are is really nice. But that message is is fleeting. It goes away as quickly as you hear it, because we live in a culture and are raised in a culture that objectifies us from every conceivable angle. This is a culture that teaches us that our bodies are objects, that as we fix our objects from the roots in our hair to the size of our pores, the length of our eyelashes, all the way down to the bottoms of our, of our feet, that is how we will find happiness, success, confidence. And so when people are trying to stage these interventions to fix people's body image issues, and they go about it in that same way by playing through those small rules of objectification, telling you how beautiful you are, reinforcing that your body and your beauty is the most important thing about you, that doesn't solve the problem. It actually exacerbates the problem. In many ways, it makes it worse. So what we recommend and what we can talk about today is that when you are coming up against a child, your sister, your dad, anybody in your circle of influence that is expressing concern about how they appear, feeling bad about their body, the right way to go about this, to intervene with them, is to help them understand that they are more than beautiful, more than a body, more than something here just to decorate the world or, or be perceived from the outside. We are so much more. 
And our message in a million little ways helps people get back to that foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, speaking more of objectification just to get to the root of it. I think every single one of us can nod our heads in agreement that we have all been raised in a culture, in communities, no matter where we're from, that uh, teaches us to objectify ourselves from the shows we watch when we're little that only show female characters looking beautiful, doing very little to move the plot forward, always with a one dimensional appearance, you know, that thinness, but the curvaceousness, the big eyes, tiny nose, round lips, you know, all those things. We are taught from a young age to believe that femininity and girlhood and women are supposed to be beautiful and need to look a certain way to be loved, successful, healthy, Mm -hmm. all the things. These are not messages that little boys get about themselves. They get a lot more messages about what it means to be a boy, what it means to be successful, normal, look like a boy. And so we want people to understand and see objectification every time it shows up in our culture. Every time we compliment little girls about how they look before asking them anything else about themselves. Every time we bond with each other by talking about, oh, I feel so fat today, or oh, my skin just looks so terrible. Tell me about your skincare routine. I need some help here. Every time we talk about women and ourselves as parts instead of people, that's objectification. And when we can uproot that problem, when we can see ourselves as more, more than bodies, more than parts in need of fixing, oh my gosh, progress moves forward in the most amazing ways. I've got two girls at home. Tanya's got two girls at home. You have two girls at home. And then I have a son. He's the odd one out of all of our Yes. <laughs> and I can tell you the difference, seeing the contrast between having two girls and then having a boy, that he doesn't care what he looks like. He doesn't care if his hair is done. He doesn't care if his shoes match his shirt. Like all he cares about is if he's comfortable, like if he can play and move his body. And I noticed with the, my six-year-old stepdaughter that that narrative of caring if things matched and if people thought she was cute, like about, I really noticed it at five. Like I was like, oh, kindergarten. I was like, whoa, whoa, like let's back this up a little bit. But it, it just seen the contrast of, of, just how that socialization happens. Oh like, yeah. <sighs> and think about like when you're shopping for your kids, when I shop for, I have a two year old, she'll be three soon and a six year old in first grade. And I am a very light skinned, light eyed blonde person who had melanoma at age 27. And I am now adamant about sun protection in every way. And so I have these two little blonde haired, blue eyed, light skinned daughters who are prone to melanoma because I had it. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm shopping for swimsuits for them, I have to go to the boys section where the shorts are longer. The board shorts are, are always three inches longer, at least, or shorts are available when they're not available in the girls section. And the rash guards offer full coverage where you can't even find them in the girls section. And it's just one way, you know, when you're dressing... Um, your child in the winter or in the summer and the shorts are are too tiny for girls where they're going to burn their legs on the slide or they can't run and stretch or uh, the fact that there are no pockets anywhere. In these ways, you can see how as a culture, we've all just agreed that it is absolutely normal that when your girl child is a baby, you're going to dress her differently and you're going to prioritize looks and bows that are uncomfortable and ear piercings that are painful and all of the little things that we tell girls they have to put on that femininity and being a girl takes work. It's why when they're watching cartoons, you can tell when the baby shark is a girl because the baby shark has rosy makeup cheeks and eyelashes and pearls and a bow in their hair. But the boy shark just gets to be. And then it continues from the time they're little with social media. So then, you know, then they hit the teen years and then suddenly we have this whole skewed version of what's actually happening for our kids because the people that they see on social media don't look anything like them. And then what do we do with that? 
Oh, absolutely. To be able to teach our kids very early on to trust their instincts as they're scrolling. I mean, we write a lot in our book about advice for parents about what to do when your child comes of age and wants to be online. They want a phone. They want to be on social media. You get to decide for you and your child what works best. But we don't see a world where anybody younger than 12 or 13 needs access to social media, I'd say much later. I'm being conservative here. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you agree. <laughs> we agree. We agree. We, my, four, my 14 year old is not allowed on social media. Oh, good. Oh, there's just no, I'm, like, there's not even a, a negotiation. I was like, no, <laughs> you, don't oh need, you don't need that yet. There's yes. no way. Like we talk about, we have this list of pros and cons that you can, you can kind of create with your child when they want to get on social media. And you can ask questions like, okay, let's talk about some of the pros of why you want to be there. A better sense of community, you know what your friends are up to, you know, to be able to get access to like information and activists and really cool stuff that we didn't have access to when we were growing up. Um, it, it, there are ways that social media can provide that connection. But as you know, as I know, when you read the research, you see that especially for girls and for women, social media, the longer you spend on it, but any amount of time spent on social media leads directly to really negative consequences to these feelings of body shame, of increased loneliness, not community and connection, but loneliness to feelings of um, deep dissatisfaction with how they appear and with what they're doing with their lives, like feeling that fear of missing out, that they're never doing enough. And so that would be some of the cons you can list out. You can say, yeah, I can see how there's some benefits there, but I'm, I'm really worried. Like, let's read up about some of these negative consequences. And then at the point that your child is on social media and you're monitoring how much time, you want to help them from a very young age sit inside their bodies and feel the feelings that come up as they're scrolling. If it's even somebody in real life that they love, that they're following on social media, but that person has bought into the very objectifying ideals that say, in order to show up and be loved, you need to face tune your face. You need to always have a filter on. You need to be showcasing your body in these ways. Then your child can have that instinct to say, I love them and they're more than a body. And they might not know that right now, but I'm going to show love for them and I'm going to show love for myself by continuing to scroll or by muting their profile, by unfollowing if they need to, by doing what they can to take care of themselves. Because for every individual, it comes down to like social media is self-help or self-harm and nobody's going to do that work for you. Mm -hmm. So being able to teach your kids to know what hurts and what helps can allow them to kind of take those reins and be literate on their own at the point that they are having more access to social media. And I think that what you're asking is for really deep critical thinking skills that yeah. young children do not have the capacity to do that, yes. to be self-reflective, to think about their outer experiences, their inner experiences. How does this make me feel? What are the choices I want to make? Like that's a lot yeah. of executive functioning our young ones can't do. Yeah. Like there's just, that brain isn't there yet. And it takes a long time for that brain to get there. Amen. And, yeah. 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 I love that. Yeah. yeah. Cause we need that too. As yeah. adults. Totally. Like, I have to use social media in that way. I don't follow any influencers. I don't follow anybody, even in my own life that I love, that is posting a lot of that kind of aspirational content that makes you feel like you need to go shopping or you need to fix something real fast. I just, I love them, but I can't be involved. And so I spend very little time on my personal social media because of that. I know that that is going to be a trigger for me. I'm still a person living in a female body trying to navigate this world as best I can. And you can have like a full PhD in the work of body image resilience and still know that you have to protect yourself every day to remember that you're more than a body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I remember you were speaking at our workshop last year and it was one of the best workshops we had. It was amazing. Got, you guys got such great reviews. And oh. I was just devastated to learn that girl self-esteem drops 30% by the time they're eight. By yes. eight. Like, I was just... And then you cited that 53% of 13-year-old girls perceive their bodies as negative. And yeah. this rises to 78% by 17 years. And then you also gave some stats on adult women that I'm not even going to get into because this is our focus as kids and teens. But yeah. uh, I... 
devastating. Yes. So what do you think accounts for this? Like what, I mean, you spoke a little bit about body objectification, obviously being part of that, but yeah. you know, what else do you think is there that maybe we're not, we haven't covered so far in this talk? I mean, it still comes back to objectification, but I want to explain this phenomenon that happens to all of us. And it happens to young girls earlier than eight a lot of times, although I think the negative repercussions of it must hit right around eight, like we see from this research. Um, when you grow up and grow older in a world that convinces you that you're here to be looked at first, that you're a body first and you're a person second. That happens for young girls at a very young age. Um, in our book, we use a metaphor to talk about this. We talk about uh, little children playing on the beach and even imagining yourself doing a little bit of inner child work to imagine being a, a young girl playing on the beach and not before when you were free from self-consciousness, when you could just hunch over in the sand and play in the sand and not worry about your belly and not be nervous that you were going to the beach that day and not knowing what to wear. But when you just had that full embodied joy in your body, just playing and, and trying to think back to those first times that you were invited into the water, the water that in our metaphor, we refer to as the sea of objectification. At what point did you start to feel self-conscious of your body? Was it when your mom made a comment about what you were eating or what she was eating, what she shouldn't be eating? Oh, I shouldn't have that right now. Was it when you saw what girls were bullied at school and what girls were um, being paid attention to? Was it your sister's magazines, the shows you were watching that featured one-dimensional versions of female characters? In all of these ways, something happens to us. We split from ourselves. The term is called self-objectification. Self-objectification happens when you watch yourself live as an outsider. You picture yourself living instead of just living inside your body, like as an embodied person inside. And for little girls, that happens as they experience these things I listed. And we all have memories of that happening. Of The first time I remember being in second grade, so yeah, eight years old looking down at my little thighs in my spandex floral shorts. We were all kneeling in a circle at reading time. And I looked down at my thighs. I compared them to all the other little thighs and saw that mine were much bigger. And I thought I got this shame feeling that rose up inside of me. And I thought, what have I done wrong? What am I doing that makes me different and bad? It was already a moral judgment that my big thighs were bad. And uh, we all have those experiences. But what we're referring to, this idea of self-objectification, as you get older, you watch yourself float away from yourself over and over again. We start living in the in the metaphor, the sea of objectification. It feels so comfy in the water over time. Everybody you know is in the water. You forget your whole self back on the shore. You can't imagine getting out of the water. It's cold. That's uncomfortable. We all live in this state of self-objectification, picturing ourselves living instead of just living. And in that state of being self-conscious, research shows that we perform worse on like math tests, reading comprehension tests. You can't throw a softball as far. You can't lift as heavy of weights. You can't get into a flow state when you're creating art or studying or working out, whatever the thing is that you need to be immersed in. You can't do because a portion of your subconscious mind is spent devoted to thinking about how you appear, even when you're alone by yourself in a room. It's kind of like the imaginary audience that we see in teens, except women don't get to grow out of it. You don't remember like intro to psych, you learn about that, like in graduate school or university, how teens always feel like teens always feel like someone's watching them. So they have, they're very egocentric. So because imaginary audience, except it sounds like we as women don't grow out of that. Like if we just stay stuck there. Absolutely. Yeah, you nailed it. It's this phenomenon that, you know, we speak to, we travel around and we speak to big audiences. And when we're speaking to audiences with multiple genders, the men in the room, the boys in the room always look at us like we are crazy when we talk about self-objectification, because it is not a phenomenon that many of them experience. They just don't. And yet the girls and women in the room, anybody who identifies as female, sits there feeling emotional about it because it's this aha moment that they suddenly have a name for a thing that they've always experienced and didn't even know was wrong 
didn't even know was abnormal, just thought that's just how we live. And you can see how self-objectification shows up in your own life when, you know, for me and Lindsay, Lindsay's TED Talk explains when we were young and we quit competitively swimming on our city swim team after 10 years of being competitive swimmers and finding so much joy there. We both at around age 15 or 16 suddenly felt like we were too fat to be there. And I guess it wasn't really sudden. It had built up over time, seeing cellulite on our legs and not seeing it on other girls' legs and feeling like, oh, this is embarrassing or having to suck in our our little stomachs because we just felt self-conscious out on the you know, on the patio. And for so many of us, we stop raising our hands in class to answer the question because we're having a really bad hair day or there's a big zit growing on my face and I don't want anybody else to see me. You stop walking to the front of the class or going up for those like volunteer opportunities or leadership opportunities at your job. You stop um, working out during PE or at the gym on your own time because you don't want to be looked at. You don't want to, you don't want anybody to see you jiggling or sweaty or, you know, red in all of these ways, we we teach ourselves that we are less than, that we must hold ourselves back from living joyful, happy lives, embodied lives, because we have been taught we do not deserve it. And that once we fix ourselves, then we can qualify to be seen again. Mm-hmm. And yet think about the progress, the opportunities for so many of us that we are held back from. And conversely, think about the opportunities. If more of us, if just the people listening to this podcast could devote a tiny percentage of their time during the day to getting back inside their bodies, and we can talk about how you do that, of helping the kids in their lives to stay inside their bodies and appreciate their bodies for what they can do, for how they feel can you imagine the opportunities, the joy, the the power that enters this world when more of us can stay whole inside our bodies as our own? We are so excited to announce ICP's Children's Mental Health and Parenting Conference. The two-day online event will take place on November 26th and 27th, 2022. The conference keynote address will be by Dr. Lara Markham, who will talk on parenting for resiliency. Over the next two days, there are 14 half and full day workshops led by experts on a variety of topics, including highly sensitive children, childhood trauma, holistic mental health, childhood anxiety, classroom mental health, technology, divorce, empowering learners, compassionate discipline, resiliency, autism, sexuality, trauma-informed yoga, and childhood ADHD. All workshops are recorded and available for 60 days. Additionally, these courses qualify for continuing education hours and a certificate of completion can be obtained. The Institute's vision is that parents and professionals will walk away from the conference with a toolbox of new ideas and strategies to help children reach their fullest potential. Find out more now at icphelps.com. I mean, it's also sad when I listen to this. And as a mom, my wish for my two little girls is not very different to all other parents' wish. Is that, you know, I think about my six-year-old, for instance, I want her to grow up strong and resilient and courageous. Mm -hmm. And I think that is probably the wish of many, many parents. So how do we do that? How do we even start? Yeah, I love your question. I sit here with a six-year-old. I want the same thing for her. And I think the first thing to know is that for so many of us, especially as parents, especially as moms, you just feel this sense of dread thinking about those innocent little people having to navigate a world that is painful and that has caused us all so much pain. It's just inevitable. And yet I sit here doing this work and hearing like the worst stories you can imagine about body image from people, but I feel such hope such, and I see it happening. I see change happening in real time, not just for these little ones coming up, but for people our age and older that are learning to live more resiliently. And the resilience doesn't come from living in a comfort zone. It comes from being challenged. The resilience comes from pain. And so I think it's so important to start with with you, to start with us and our own experiences in our bodies. And 
to grieve, you know, what we've been through, but also to recognize where that pain has propelled you. If you have responded to, to some of that pain in your life, especially in terms of your body image, if you have responded in ways that have served you, that have allowed you to, to even see the pain, to name it, you know, instead of just to swallow it as like, I deserve this, you know, to be able to name that pain is so incredibly important to name the self-objectification as it arises, to see that that is pain that you do not deserve and to see what responses you have you have made to that pain that is resilience and so i don't while we are going to all do our best to shield our kids from pain you guys know as well as i do that the pain they go through it's going to make them them mm -hmm. it's going to make them more of who they are of who they're meant to be who the world needs them to be because we need change makers. We need resilient people in this world to be able to advocate for those who have less of a voice, who have less power. And so the first thing I would say is it's okay. Like our kids are going to go through some stuff. They're going to be told mean things at school. They're going to, even from people you know and love, from grandma and grandpa, you know, from friends and neighbors, it is going to happen, but we can arm them with a few tools. So from the time kids are little, and I'm going to speak specifically about girls here for a moment. One of the things I see that I'm really hopeful about is that younger generations are less tied to the gender binary of male and female, of girl and boy. And I actually see a lot of progress in this way because gender has become you know, capitalism has made gender something that you buy and something you put on. And so for girls, that requires us to buy and put on a lot just to feel like ourselves. And so from the time my girls were very little, one thing I vowed to do is to prioritize practicality over pretty with them. So when they are getting dressed, when we are buying clothes, um, what I do is I make sure to prioritize the comfort that we talked about earlier, like your little boy cares about. And so when my daughter, Logan, the six-year-old is trying on clothes, I say, is it soft? Is it comfy? Do you feel like you can lunge in it? Do a jumping jack for me. Like, can you move around? Is it scratchy? Do you feel good? And a lot of those girls clothes with the frills are so scratchy. Mm -hmm. It's so terrible. You have to wear a shirt underneath, you know, it's just, so being able to help her feel her body, how do I feel in this? Can I move in this? Can I pr prioritize what I can do and how I feel in my clothing? That's most important. And so that even means like, if it doesn't match or isn't as trendy or stylish as maybe you want it to be, if you can help her first prioritize her comfort, her own body, her first person perspective, then maybe you can do with it not matching as well as you wanted because she's kind of reclaiming that that first person perspective of her body, not that outsider's perspective. And so when it comes to hair, I've done the same thing. Uh, in my own life, I keep my hair super natural. I wash it and then I put it in a bun and then I take it out of a bun. And so I don't own like um, curling irons or straightening irons and everybody's hair is different. Hair is just another thing that we require of girls that we don't require of boys in the same way. And so it becomes this beauty work you put on. So for my girls, every day, I put their hair up in a messy little bun. And I say, okay, let's get your hair out of your face. And that's the goal. My two-year-old every day, she knows we get the hair out of her face so she can play. And Logan is now in first grade and has still worn a bun, even for school picture day, every day. And she has not yet felt like she needs to get her hair curled. And curling your hair is not a bad thing. It's not bad to put bows in your kid's hair. None of that is bad, but it does take time. And it does teach them what it takes, you know, to, to just be them. Yeah. I curl my hair. Yeah. And uh, only for things like this. Let me be clear. Like, <laughs> my husband is like, you must be doing a podcast today. Like, you actually did your hair. <laughs> anyway. And, uh, you know, for a while there, my six-year-old wanted to do her hair. And this year, I saw a huge shift where she doesn't care. Uh -huh. And I caught myself about three weeks ago saying, do you want me to curl your hair? And she looked at me. She's like, is my hair not okay the way it is? And I just had to be like... Oh, I didn't even know what to say. I was like, oh my God, Tammy, like you yeah. know better. <laughs> of course her hair is fine. Like, 
Why does it need to be yeah. cringe? Yeah, anyway, and it's just I get these, it. these insidious little messages were given. Yeah. And here I am drinking the Kool-Aid. I curled my hair today. So- <laughs> no, you're not. Like, and we can talk about this too. We could do a whole other podcast about like, <laughs> where do you draw the line? Like in your own beauty. Like, and the truth is, we all get to draw the line for ourselves. And it is just a matter of thinking about the time, the money, like even the pain you want to commit to your own beauty work because it's all work, you know? And if you can reframe it as work, then you can decide what you want to do and maybe what you can like step back on. And so like, I, I'm sitting, I'm wearing makeup, you know, I covered my zits today. <laughs> I try to keep everything very minimal and I want it to to not take very much time at all because I want to look like me either way, like with or without makeup. I don't want my girls to see that it takes time and a lot of money to do what it takes to just look like me. But I readily admit, I am buying into this sexist world. You know, we all are navigating this world. And so there's no room for shame or blame for anyone, for what any of us choose to do. We are all navigating a super difficult world. But what I'm trying to do for my girls at a very early age is the most minimum amount of work possible so that they can see that they can be loved and valued like by the kids at school, by anybody just showing up like in the dinosaur t-shirt that's way too big and the little stretchy shorts and the hair in a bun. And she is beloved, you know, like, or doing her best to make friends, but loved, you know? (laughs) And I I think in that way, um, it is just one of many ways that we can start to help our kids stay inside themselves. And that also comes to the media they're viewing. You have to be extremely careful. And I am, I know we all are with the shows our kids watch. I am very wary of princess ideals of ideal of shows that only feature girls doing nothing. Like no girls are in the show or in group scenes. It's one girl and five boys, which is the norm with kids media. I'm very wary of these things. I try very hard to make sure that my girls are watching shows with a female protagonist. And I try very hard to find body diversity in the shows we're watching. And that means that it's just a no-go if we're watching a show and all the girls are have those princess ideals and those perfect little figures. We're not going to do it. And we talk about that. And then we create our own media Art, she draws, she paints, she sculpts to think about what her girl characters could look like. So my little one, her yeah. favorite is Spider-Man. Um, yes. Because it's so hard to find those strong girl characters. I know. I fully agree. My daughter has a Spider-Man sweatshirt and she was Spider-Girl <laughs> for Halloween. So yeah. <laughs> I was. I know like as a mom, I was so appreciative when Encanto came out this year. Yeah. Like Moana is another really good one that I was like, yes. I'm like, you watch that as many times as you want. Like Me you can too. watch that on replay all day long. Me too. And that's good for my son to see this too. Like yes. that girls strong. are strong too. And that's important. I think is we're like we have to empower girls absolutely but we also have to re-educate our boys that girls are not just to look at like girls are equally as smart and equally as fast and they have different gifts but those gifts are not less important than your own like that those those conversations need to happen with boys too like we do right because they're they're taught differently to like just because they see the message that's different how mom talks or dad talks to the girls versus because I catch it in our house. I catch my husband telling the girls, you're so pretty today. You're so cute today. And saying to my son, look how fast you can run. And I'm like, stop (laughs) saying you're cute. I know. Oh my gosh. But it is so true. Like it is trying to help our boys and every other male, all of us, to unlearn really sexist tropes that start very young. Mm -hmm. And that means for boys, ensuring that they are watching, when you can, as many female protagonists in their shows as boy protagonists. They need to see girls. And when they say, that's a girl show, or that's a girl thing, we say, huh, I wonder why you think that. Why do you think that Boy shows are for everyone and girl shows are only for girls. And you can talk to them about sexism, about how it wasn't very many years ago when girls couldn't even vote, when girls were married off at a young age and were considered property. 
of their husbands. You can, it's, I'm already having these discussions with my daughter about sexism. And so now when she's about to watch a show, we say, is this sexist? How is it representing girls? Are the girls represented well? And she can answer me. Lexi, what about the other way? So um, an older generation, like grandparents, who are more set in their ways, who'll say things yeah. like, you're so cute, or do you have a boyfriend <laughs> yet? You know, to, to a six-year-old, you know, little things like that. Mm -hmm. yep. Playful, teasing, but still not appropriate. How do it's you recommend parents handle that? Oh man, depending on the relationship, you can shut it down softly, or firmly. When it comes to somebody like your dad or your mom, and you have a good relationship with them, you could say, you could do this a few ways. Vulnerability works really well. So coming from your own experience, you could say something like, hey, I, I appreciate, you know, pull them aside, or you can do it right in front of your kid. I appreciate the compliment you're trying to give. But to be honest, I've been thinking and, and doing a lot of like researching lately about, about body image. And I realized that growing up and growing older, I've spent too much time thinking about my body. I have just spent time wasted thinking about how I look instead of just living. And it's the last thing I want for my kid. So we've made a rule in our family that we're not going to talk about bodies at all. We're not going to talk about how bodies look at all, or we're not going to moralize food. Food isn't good or bad. It just is. All food is good. All food is, you know, and to be able to say, can you help me with that? This is just, it's something we're trying and it is difficult. So I won't get mad at you if you slip up, but we're just working on encouraging all of our kids to see themselves as more than bodies. So, and then you can give them some examples or another thing you can do when they say, oh, you're so cute. And I do this um, with Logan. I have taught her to say, thanks. And I'm smart too. Or <laughs> I love it. Thanks. And I'm reading this or, and I play soccer or whatever, add to it. You know, like shut it down by showing them there's more. Well, okay. So here's one. And this is, comes from my daughter being objectified for, because she's cute. Like she was the cute, really cute kid, the like cutesy. And people it. always tell her, like, she's so cute. She's so cute. And mm -hmm. now she fishes for compliments. I'm like, am I cute today? Am I pretty today? And I'll try and please like give me some ideas. Because at this point, I'm like, mm -hmm. well, how do you feel inside today? Yeah. Or why is that important that I tell you this? Like yeah. we try to like, have, she's pretty little though. So it's hard to, oh, sorry, she's the eight year old. So she can do okay. a little bit of that. Not the six year old. Mm -hmm. That's a boy. He could care less what he looks like. He's like, let yeah. me play. <laughs> but like when they're, when your girls are, have been taught that and they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're pulling it from you, like what is yeah. a mom, what would you say to them? When they want the compliment, they want to be told their, they, their outfit looks good or their hair looks good or, and you're trying to move away from that. What do you say? Oh yeah. I mean, on the one hand, you can definitely affirm them, but, um, add to it. So of course, you know, but how do you feel in it? Or what's your favorite part of it? Like what's your favorite color mm -hmm. in the outfit or, you know, like get them talking about what the thing is. But I, I think when that question is coming up a lot, it's definitely raising a, a, a red flag or a flag of concern. Um, that you can see, you've already articulated, a lot of her value has come from this. A lot of her affirmations have come from this. And so we see this in, you know, when we're doing these big speaking events and looking out at the audience, a lot of times I catch myself seeing like the most beautiful women in the room and thinking just this reflexive thinking, I bet they're rolling their eyes. You know, I, I bet they, I bet they just think that I'm you know, the kinds of comments we get, you're too fat or too ugly. You're just jealous of beautiful women, you know? And so, but then those women always prove me wrong. They are always the first ones up to us after the presentation to say, thank you so much. This means the world to me. My entire life, I competed in beauty pageants, was told how beautiful I was, got all the attention from men and have never been single. And I'm trying to figure out who I am now. Because for beautiful women who are, who, appear closest to the ideals, they are affirmed in those objectifying ways their whole lives. And that's where they find their value. And it hurts to inevitably age, gain weight, change, get injured, get sick, and not get that same affirmation. And so they have to work harder to stay there. So to, to have just a very young girl, you have all the power in the world to be able to kind of flip this, to see the red flag, and to flip it a little bit. So it's time to start, maybe not in the moment when she asks, but it's time to start having some conversations about sexism, about the shows she's watching, about what kids at school are saying about girls and boys, mm. and pointing out how unjust and how unfair 
girls are represented in media and treated culturally. Talk about things like the dress code as they get older. A lot of, a lot of schools and organizations have a really um, sexist dress code that tells girls everything they need to wear inch by inch, what can be shown, what can't be shown, and tells boys, make sure your underwear isn't showing or, you know, make sure you're wearing a, a full shirt. And so to be able to help her just see the way she's been taught to see herself as only beautiful will help her to start to question it so that maybe when those questions come up in the future, you can start saying, oh, do you think you're asking me that because you've kind of like swallowed or, or whatever the word is you can use for an eight year old uh, that means internalized um, some of these ideals that are so unfair and so dumb. Like we need to disparage how ridiculous and dehumanizing and painful these ideals are because she's perfect as she is perfect. Even if she, you can challenge her to, um, to not do all the cutesy stuff to maybe just show up a little bit more plain one day and to prove to herself that even without the affirmations, she is still her, you know, it's the same thing we have to do for ourselves when we wear makeup or don't wear makeup or do our hair or don't wear our hair. That is very inspiring. Thank you. Cause oh, I know yeah. it's, I, I have to be honest when I had a, found out I was having a boy, there was a part of me that was a little bit relieved. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. there's that piece. Cause you know, he's not going to bear that same burden that women bear. Yeah. Like, yeah. And don't get me wrong, I value the girls no. very much, but I just know his life will be easier in a lot of ways. Like, yeah. I just know this. Like, he won't. I, I think that these, and I feel a lot of hope that these boys are going to be allies in a way that our generations of boys and men have not been taught to be and have taught to be against, mm -hmm. you know? To girly things are, oh, you know, to disparage girly things. Well, that doesn't happen like it used to. I mean, of course, there's this resurgence of toxic masculinity that will always come up as like a pendulum flip to feminism, a, you know, a swing. But I really believe that we can teach our kids to rebel against these old school, ridiculous, sexist messages. And they're already doing it. They're already bucking these trends with more gender neutral clothing which I think is an amazing thing um, with not really caring about old school media, like the TV shows and the, it's different now. And, and in many ways, I just, I feel a lot of hope that we are getting to a place and will continue to move toward a place that is more equal, that can teach all of us that we're more. And I know it starts with parents. I know it does. And I'm seeing that hope in my own girls. My six and a half year old has not yet, started talking badly about bodies or food, it'll happen at some point. I know it will. And that doesn't mean I did anything wrong or that any of us, anybody listening did anything wrong. We're all doing the best we can. We're all also doing stuff wrong, but not on purpose, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think being able to have that compassion for ourselves and teach that self-compassion to our kids will allow them to stay inside their bodies a little bit longer and to be aware that when they are floating outside of their bodies, feeling self-conscious to see it in a way that we were never taught to because we didn't even have words for it, to be able to come back inside and really treat their bodies as instruments for their use, for their experience, not as ornaments to be admired. That's one of our favorite mantras of yours is your body's an instrument, not an ornament. It's so beautiful. What I'm hearing is the biggest takeaway is just have these conversations with your girls. Look at media together. Look at Instagram together. Look at YouTube yes. together. Like being able to help them be critical consumers of media and culture, like asking questions of everything to teach them that ideas don't come out of nowhere. Ideas aren't just innate or natural that somebody is conceiving of ideas and that generally there is money. There is profit to be had behind the ideas that we believe girls should attain and boys should attain. And being able to help them ask those questions of how they feel about themselves, of how people talk about girls and women, of what they're seeing in media, of who's being sold what, you know, scrolling through Instagram and seeing what your sponsored posts look like about Have the ideals. Done? Old. we've done that I've done that experiment with my partner where we look at the ads like each one of us has on our Facebook oh my gosh. and I was actually quite happy with both of us like mostly for me it's outdoor stuff and horses okay. and <laughs> his is tractors and dirt bikes and like so none of it is selling us like bodies so we're like okay I That's think amazing. we're like consuming like 
pretty and, or child stuff because the difference in maybe what we're ingesting in that those ads definitely tell you like how much time you're spending looking oh at gosh. beauty stuff versus yeah it's such a problem but I do I think helping kids just be critical and they already want to be so mm -hmm. lean into that you know, lean into that critical side that rebellious side of rebelling against these old school industries that are trying to harm us like actively harm us I think kids like that I think they're they're willing to do more of that than we think they are. Okay, so we're going to give you three quick questions. Okay. What is the worst advice that you've heard when it comes to our girls? Just keep reminding them how beautiful they are, and one day they'll realize it. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, your research has said that is blatantly wrong. <laughs> okay, and what is the best advice you were given about raising girls or improving body image in girls? Other than mm. your own book. <laughs> yeah. from I have to get outside of myself for this one. It's, it's probably around self-compassion. It was stuff I learned through Dr. Kristen Neff, who is like the pioneer of working <laughs> self-compassion. Mm -hmm. I think that understanding that we're all navigating this world, like having the compassion to say, I'm doing my best. I will make mistakes and it's okay and be able to um, help my girls to really understand how powerful and wonderful they are, that compassion that they're going to make mistakes, that they're not always on their best behavior, and that's okay. That's all part of being human. Um, I think that self-compassion key has been really wonderful for me. You mentioned Dr. Neff. Is there anybody else or any other resources that you would say to parents besides for your own, who you would mm -hmm. say, this is something that you should look at? Yeah. One of our colleagues at Rutgers University, her name is um, Dr. Charlotte Markey. She um, just wrote a positive body image workbook for girls and mm -hmm. one for boys. Mm -hmm. a separate one for boys. Um, and they're available all over. They're really great comprehensive resources for kids ages like maybe 10 and up, 11 and up, somewhere in there. L look her up online. We She'd will. We definitely will be looking Beautiful. that up. But we, we recommend your book. Uh, Thank you. We also have your um, talk that you guys gave for yeah. the Institute as people can purchase too. So we'll oh, include good. a link to, in that, to that in the comments. But your book was uh, More Than a Body. Your body is an instrument, not an ornament. And that can be found hardcover, Absolutely. soft hire, online, Amazon, ebook. Yes, audiobook. We we read it ourselves, so you can listen if you oh. haven't gotten enough of my voice. <laughs> you can listen to it. Lindsay and I split up the chapters, and we actually can't tell who's reading each chapter because we sound so similar. Right? <laughs> Even you yeah. can't figure it out. Yeah. yeah but, well, Lexi, thank you so much. It's given me so much to think about. Yeah, it's thank so inspirational. You. Yeah, well, just all of us have girls. And I mean, just if you have children, period, I think hopefully parents listening took that, that's important to have these conversations with our boys too, and kids yeah. of who identify as whatever they identify as that we need yeah. to talk about our relationship with our bodies is important. And how we view other people and other children too. Amen. So, thank you so much. And again, everyone, if you want their book, it is More Than a Body. That is the wonderful book that they wrote. Thank you so much for coming Thanks, on Nancy. our podcast. We have so much more to share with you at ITP. And whether you're looking for parenting support or you're a professional looking for strategies to help children who are struggling with their mental health, we have the answers you're looking for. At ICP, we offer a unique membership program that gives you access to over 60 accredited online courses and past conference workshops offered by the top experts on the planet and also provides a community platform where you can connect with like-minded professionals and parents sharing ideas, resources, as well as advice from the ICP team of professionals. You can access our courses and workshops through your desktop or through our app offered exclusively to our members please go to icphelps.com to start your journey with us today.